So, ich muss jetzt, nehme doch das Mikrofon. Geht das so? Ja. ja. Okay, ja, vielen Dank. Ja, es ist eine Freude und Vergnügen, äh, François Adlock vorstellen zu dürfen. François Adlock ist zurzeit äh, der erste Reinhard Roselle Gastprofessor an der Fakultät für Geschichtswissenschaft der Universität Bielefeld. Äh, diese Gastprofessur wurde neu eingerichtet, um den 2006 verstorbenen Bielefelder Historiker Reinhard Roselle zu ehren. Auf die Gastprofessur werden einmal jährlich für zwei bis drei Monate auswärtige Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler berufen, die sich in besonderer Weise mit Themen beschäftigt haben, für die Rainer Koselik Maßstäbe gesetzt hat. Das sind also Theorien über wechselnde Sinndeutungen der Geschichte, über die Grundlagen historischer Erkenntnis, über die Geschichte politischer und historisch-philosophischer Begriffe, darunter der Geschichtsbegriff selbst. Und schließlich vor allem das Nachdenken über Zeit und das historisch wandelnde Verhältnis von Erfahrungen und Erwartungen in der Geschichte. Und genau das sind auch die Themen, mit denen François Atok sich seit vielen Jahren in zahlreichen Büchern befasst hat. Und insofern gibt es kaum jemanden, der geeigneter wäre, die erste Coselle Gastprofessur einzunehmen, als eben François Atok. Wir sind sehr dankbar, dass Sie unserer Einladung gefolgt sind und heute im Museum Bildsmann einen öffentlichen Vortrag. François Artoc ist Professor an der École des Instituts en Sciences Sociales in Paris. Die École ist eine der äh, Elite-Hochschulen in Frankreichs, in der graduierte Studierende, Doktoranden, Dozentinnen und Dozenten interdisziplinär im Feld der Geistes- und Sozialwissenschaften zusammenarbeiten. Und in den Geschichtswissenschaften ist die École seit ihrer Gründung äh, immer wieder Heimstätte für aufregender neuer Ideen und Forschungsansätze gewesen. François Artoc über historische Zeitregime und über das Spiel von Selbst- und Fremdwahrnehmungen seit der Antike bis in unsere Gegenwart sind selbst zu Anstößen für viele neue Forschungen geworden. Genau wie Koselik hat auch François Atok selbst analytische Begriffe geprägt, mit denen wir Historikerinnen und Historiker inzwischen völlig selbstverständlich umgehen. Und äh, seine vielleicht bekannteste Begriffsprägung äh, ist äh, das Historizitätsregime oder eigentlich Historizitätsregime im Plural, Regime und Historizität. Äh, François Antons Begriffsprägung sind für uns gleichsam zum unverzichtbaren Handwerkszeug geworden und das ist eigentlich für einen Historiker der höchste Ausweis, äh, wenn er oder sie Begriffe prägt, mit denen die anderen Historiker selbstverständlich arbeiten. Historizitätsregime im Plural bringt dann bringt äh, François Atok den Gedanken auf den Punkt, dass sich die Formen, in denen Menschen einer Epoche oder einer Kultur das Verhältnis von Vergangenheit, Gegenwart und Zukunft denken, also die Art und Weise, wie sie sich selbst in der historischen Zeit verorten, historisch wandelbar sind. Die Vergangenheit ist nicht mehr das, was sie einmal war, und die Zukunft war früher auch einmal anders, nicht nur die besser, wie Valentin sagt, aber anders. So könnte man den Grundgedanken sehr vereinfacht ausdrücken. Die Vorstellungen von Vergangenheit, Gegenwart und Zukunft und vor allem ihre gedachte Beziehung zueinander bleiben im Verlauf der Menschheitsgeschichte nicht die gleichen. Und das bezieht sich nicht allein, nicht einmal in erster Linie auf die wahrgenommenen Inhalte. Man muss sich von der Vorstellung freimachen, als seien die Vergangenheit und die Zukunft gleichsam Behälter oder Container, in denen man irgendetwas findet oder übersieht. Vergangenheit, Gegenwart und Zukunft sind viel mehr Motiv der menschlichen Erfahrung, der Zeiterfahrung, der Erfahrung von Dauer, von Bruch, von Neuheit oder Wiederholung. Diese Mutti der Zeiterfahrung und auch der Erfahrung des Anderen im Raum, Raum und Zeit, meint François Adok, wenn er von Historizitätsregime spricht. Von Haus aus ist François Adok Althistoriker. In seinem ersten Buch von 1980 beschäftigte er sich mit dem griechischen Autor Herodot. Le Miroir d'Herodot, der Spiegel Herodots, lautet der Titel des Buches, und Spiegelung. Spiegelungen des Anderen, des Fremden in Raum und Zeit sind François Adoks Hauptthema geblieben. François Adok hat sich aber nicht auf die Antike beschränkt. Schon sein zweites Buch führte ihn ins 19. Jahrhundert zu dem großen französischen Althistoriker Fustel de Coulange, der die Wahrnehmung der Antike, der Antique Polis vor allem, in seiner Zeit, im späten 19. Jahrhundert, radikal veränderte, indem er unter dem Eindruck der Evolutionslehre die grundlegende Andersartigkeit nicht nur der sozialen und politischen Verhältnisse, sondern der menschlichen Psyche und Ideenwelt darunter auch der Zeiterfahrung der antiken Menschen selbst herausstellte. Also auch die Veränderung des Menschen seiner Zeitwahrnehmung selbst ist das, was Fustel de Coulange äh, thematisiert hat, nicht nur, dass sich bestimmte äußere Verhältnisse verändert haben. Das Pendeln zwischen den Epochen, das Ausdruck von 
von Grenzerfahrung, und Grenzerzählungen von innen und außen, früher und später in der Koselektion, einfache Lektionen, innen und außen, früher und später, oben und unten hat er auch noch, aber daran glaube ich nicht so richtig, von alten und modernen, anciennen und modernen, Griechen und Barbaren, zivilisierten Europäern und Wilden, sind François Matocs Leitlinien, die er in vielen Büchern, Buchveröffentlichungen und anderen Publikationen ausgekundschaftet hat, die ich Ihnen hier nicht alle vorstellen kann und will, denn Sie wollen ja François Job hören und nicht mich. Erwähnen möchte ich aber wenigstens noch zwei äh, seiner neuesten Bücher, im Jahr 2015 erschienen, Partir pour la Grèce, wörtlich nach Griechenland aufbrechen. Es handelt sich dabei allerdings nicht, wie man vielleicht meinen könnte, um einen Reiseführer, oder doch um einen Reiseführer ganz eigener Art, denn es ist die Geschichte der verschiedenen Annäherungen an und Aneignungen von Griechenland in der westlichen Geschichtsschreibung und Wissenschaft und weiteren Öffentlichkeit seit der Antike bis heute. Also eine Geschichte der Denkwege, die nach Griechenland führen oder führen und führen und wieder zu uns, zur jeweiligen Gegenwart zurückführen. Der Untertitel lautet Pourquoi nous avons toujours besoin des anciens? Warum wir immer noch die Alten brauchen. Jüngst im Jahr 2017 erschien dann ein weiteres Buch: La Nation, la Religion, l'Avenir, sur les traces d'Ernest Renan. Eine Studie über Ernest Renan, also den berühmten französischen Religionswissenschaftler, Philologen und Public Intellectual der zweiten Hälfte des 19. Jahrhunderts. Den meisten unter ihnen dürfte Renan am bekanntesten sein durch sein Diktum, dass die Nation ein alltägliches Plebizid sei. La Nation est un plébiscite de tous les jours. Also die Idee, dass die Nation primär auf den Zugehörigkeitserklärungen und den Willensbekundungen der Einzelnen nicht auf vermeintlichen Wesensmerkmalen, Kasten oder Sprache beruht. Aber Renan ist noch ein wesentlich facettenreicherer Denker als nur einer, der die Nation neu gefasst hat. Er ist eben, wie gesagt, Philologe, ein vergleichender Religionswissenschaftler, ein Buch über das Leben Jesu geschrieben, was sozusagen das Komplement zu David Friedrich Strauß Buch von etwas vorher ist. Und er hat ein Buch über die Zukunft der Wissenschaft geschrieben. Das hat auch der Titel L'Avenir, und das Buch hat er, glaube ich, wenn ich mich richtig informiert, 1848 oder 1949. L'Avenir des Sciences. Du kannst ja die Position der Hand gesprochen. Das ist das Wissen in der Tat. Ich habe Bibel also er schrieb das 1848, das war dann erst ein Ende, in den 1890er Jahren ist es erst publiziert worden. Also äh, es war ein sehr vielgestaltiger Denkmal. Hinweise möchte ich zum Abschluss meiner Vorstellung noch einmal auf François Artox äh, wohl bekanntestes Buch, das Buch mit dem Titel Regime d'Historicité, erschienen zuerst 2003. Es liegt inzwischen auch in englischer Übersetzung vor, leider aber noch nicht in deutscher Übersetzung. Es sei denn, ich hätte es übersehen, aber ich habe es nicht gefunden. Es wird eigentlich mal Zeit. Das Buch trägt den Untertitel Présentisme et Experience du Temps, Präsentismus und Zeiterfahrung. Und der zuerst genannte Begriff Présentisme führt sehr nah an das heutige Vortragsthema heran. Mit dem Begriff Présentisme bringt Achtung unsere gegenwärtige Zeit und Geschichtserfahrung auf den Punkt. Geschichte scheint für uns heute, so sagt er, in erster Linie nur noch in Gestalt des erinnerungswürdigen Ereignisses, des Denkmals, als routinisiert aufgerufenes Jubiläum, als schützenswerter Erinnerungsort präsent zu sein, ohne wie in der Vormoderne Lehren aus der Vergangenheit fürs Leben zu ziehen, oder wie im 19. Jahrhundert Wegweisung für die Zukunft zu sein. Also aus der Geschichte werden weder Leben, Leben, Lehren abgeleitet, noch wird sie als ein Progress aufgefasst, der uns die Linie zeigt, mit der wir in der Zukunft weitergehen können. Ich nehme an, dass der Titel des heutigen Vortrags, Has History in the West Become a Place of Memory, auf diese Überlegungen anspielt. Und wir sind nun sehr gespannt auf Ihren Vortrag, François Atok. The floor is yours. He will give his talk in English, but we agree that the discussion can be in all three languages, English, French, and German, and I will translate the German questions to him into French or English, as the case may be. Okay, thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your extremely uh, kind and extremely vivid and extremely precise uh, 
presentation. To visit Bielefeld as a path right now, because the gas professor is a great honor. So my first words are to thank warmly all those who made possible this invitation. And in the first place, the center of theory in history with his current director, Lars Day. I heard that I was sometime an assistant of Freinhard Koselik. I wish I could have been, <laughs> but no, I'm sorry, it never happened. Among many reasons, there is one I would like to draw briefly your attention on, because it says something on the way in which intellectual relations work or have worked between France and Germany. I mean the translations. The Fernandes Kunst came out in Germany in 1979 and in France in 1990, which is, after all, relatively rapid. <laughs> <laughs> but critic and critic had to wait 20 years to get a French translation. So, coming from the field of ancient history and being not Germanist in any meaning of the word, I start to read Kasselik only in the 90s when I was at the beginning of my reflections around time and historical time. Today, the situation has changed. The only question for the circulation of a book now is whether a book, this book, is translated into English or not, and how long does it take? If I was not an assistant, of Reinhard Kasselik, I have an intellectual debt toward his work. And if there is a place to acknowledge it, it's here. I'm glad to have the opportunity to do it to be seen. In fact, without his semantics of historical time, without, without his two meta-historical historical categories of field of experience and horizon of expectation, it would have been much more difficult to formulate the concept of regime of historicity. More broadly, I learned from him to look at a conjuncture, narrow or large, through an interrogation on time, about time, what kinds of experiences of time are there. I hope that this lecture is not too unfaithful to his teaching. So, Clio had history in the West become a place of memory or a lieu de mémoire. Is history a European lieu de mémoire or place of memory? Is it, is it not an iconoclastic question which still in the 1970s would have surprised or even shocked historians. In the best case scenario, they would not have grasped the meaning of the question because it was understood that on one side there was memory and on the other there was history and their domain, domain of the historians, which began where memory left off. Since then, great upheavals marked by the irresistible rise of memory in Europe and beyond uh, occurred. And by the way, the very recent awarding of the Frieden Preis des Deutschen Buchhandels to Halida and Jan Asman might be seen, of course, at their recognition of their work in the field of memory studies, but also probably, or the importance of memory issues today. 
Don't know why they're waiting for you. But the memorial wave have also led to an interrogation of history, both as a discipline and as a dominant belief of the modern war world, a world which is no longer our own. So we must ask if history, with capital H, history, which has accompanied this modern world and which has managed to tell it and give meaning, can also continue to be our own. It's not my purpose here to retrace the long journey of the world history in Europe since Herodotus' pioneering inquiry in the 5th century before our era. If the world had survived 25 centuries, its uses and understandings have varied widely. When each era took the world up again, they molded it to their own designs, while mending from past uses a variable path always open to revision. It, it was there, simultaneously familiar and convenient, having quickly become the world history, a self-evident fact, and renewed again and again because it allowed an ordering of what had happened and what would happen and because it offered new insights about the world and its past. What was history about, if not to understand more, in order to act better in the present, in its present, in each of the succession of presents? Since antiquity, Clio has been recognized as the muse of history, because those whom she sang acquired a beautiful, a great, and immortal glory, which serves as a reminder that in Greece the first history came out of the epic. Before Herodotus, there was Homer. For a long while, history was the celebration of heroic deeds, rulers, great men. Its purpose was to provide examples to imitate, or, in some cases, not to imitate. But today, Clio seems to have been supplanted in our European societies by nebosune, or memory, known since easier as the mother of the muses. She was so well known that, in a kind of fear invention, the mother, so to speak, to the place, took the place of the daughter. It's no longer history that judges and gorges memory, but memory which returns to history to question it, even sometimes to reject it. Regardless, memory has difficulties to understand what history was able to represent, to represent between the end of the 18th century and the end of the 20th century for a world whose new religion, history, aspired to be. This period corresponded to the foundation and affirmation of the modern world, nation states and colonial empires walked hand in hand, but two world wars later, a Europe drained and in ruins, then abandoned its empires and threw itself headlong into reconstruction. Another era began, the Cold War, a struggle between East and West that was at the same time an arms race and a race for progress. It continued up through the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the fall of the Soviet Empire shortly thereafter. Its history is well known, but this paper is not about that history. Viewed with insight, this century and a half appears, appears as an era of particularly active, agitated, and very violent universal history, which revolutionized the world, bringing together scientific discoveries, technological achievements, and destruction, 
social advances, and savage exploitation, democratic regimes, and brutal dictatorships, deaths in the millions, mass murders, and genocides, all at unprecedented scale and pace. Among all the conditions that made this singular journey possible, which did, which did more than just add another chapter to the old schema of one empire, empire after another, and the plot of providential history, one find in the book of Daniel, what role did history play? He did history as a concept. And by history, I mean the conception of history, or better yet, the modern concept of history. And if it has played a role, which one and in which way? To answer, let's, let's us start from a general proposition, which we will try to verify. In our experience of time, the concept of history inevitably changes as soon as our relationship to time changes. Since the development of the first calendars, human groups have always made time a social object as well as, as, well as a religious, political, and economic issue. And the emergence of a properly historical time coincided with what we have called modern time. In Europe, let us begin with the definition of history that Pierre Laus, who was the very important figure in the second half of the 19th century, and the author of the main dictionary in the French dictionary, the great, the grand Laus, the great Laus, Pierre Laus gave in the 1870s, uh, at the time, so the definition of history, he gave at a time when its powerful status was well established. I quote, The historical movement, inaugurated in the 17th by Bossuet and continuing throughout the 18th century with Vico, Herder, Condorcet, and that and then developed even further by a collection of remarkable minds in our 19th century, that's uh, that was speaking, cannot fail to increase even more in the near future. Today, history has become, so to speak, a universal religion. It is this time, this time, this time, this destiny, is to become, within modern civilization, what theology was in the Middle Ages and in antiquity. The queen of the sciences and the mediator of consciousness. So that's not, that's not literal. And the new religion and to take the place of which was before occupied by theology. And you can find many uh, statements of the same kind in the same period, but this one I think is uh, especially uh, clear. What was required, we might ask, for such a profession of faith in history and its future? Over this long journey, the principal stages included the recognition that men make history, the passage from a conception of perfectibility to progress, the escape from the shackles of a 6,000 year biblical chronology, and the opening to an indefinite future. Time, as Ernest Renan put it, then appeared, as I quote, the universal factor, the great coefficient of an eternal becoming. In that respect, Renan goes on, all the sciences, when sorted by their object in relation to time, became historical. And history, and history of human societies, appeared to be the youngest of the sciences, and of thought. 
we went from a history, mistress of life, magistra vitae, and belonging to rhetoric, to a history, so to speak, mistress of a universe in constant evolution and aspiring to become a science. We emerge from what I call the old regime of historicity and enter the modern regime of historicity, which is characterized by the predominance of the category of the future and by a widening, widening gap between the field of experience and the horizon of expectations to use the categories of Reinhard Kassel. The future is the telos, the goal. The light that illuminates the past comes from it. Time is no longer a simple ordering principle, but the actor, the agent of a historical process, which is nothing other than progress itself. This history, which men, which men make, is experience, experience as accelerated in this world, which has become historical. One can only believe in history. This belief can be diffused, reflective, theorized by philosophers of history like Hegel and Marx, disputed, but it's increasingly shared. It was Alexis de Tocqueville, who in 1840, in his book, The um, um, Democracy in America, who in 1840 gave the clearest formulation of this move to change. I quote, when the past no longer illuminates the future, the mind walks in the darkness. With these words, he rightly takes note of the end of the old regime of historicity, precisely when light came from the past. At the same time, he, 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 he notes, he put an end, an end to the old regime, and at the same time, he gives the formula of the, for the modern regime. That is to say, it is the, the key to the, to the intelligibility of the world since 1789, where it is from now on the future that illuminates the past, and traces the past of the action. One must look to the future, and for him, for Tocqueville in this case, that means from America, in order for France and Europe to detect this irres irresistible step toward the equality of conditions. So he travels, in a way, travels to the future in order to look back to Europe and to understand that from now on the light comes the future, and with this light coming from the future, you understand what's going on in your own present. <clears throat> in this way, mind no longer march forward through the darkness. In a new time, a new history was needed. Since the history linked to the old regime of historicity was no longer operative, it shed light on nothing. In the old regime of historicity, before 17 89 to use a symbolic date, the actors certainly at their present, they live in this present, try to understand it and to control it. But in order to find their bearings and give meaning to their historical experience, experience they began by looking at the past with the idea that it was the bearer of intelligibility, of examples and of lessons. And history was an inventory of those examples and the story of those lessons. Whereas in the modern regime, it was the opposite. We looked to the future. It was the future that illuminated the present and explained the past. It was to it that we had to turn as quickly as possible. If it oriented historical experience and history was Teleological, the goal indica indicated the past already traveled as well as the one still to be traveled. All 
modern national and imperial histories have been conceived and written on the basis of this model, in Europe first and then in the rest of the world. It became the pattern upon which the other histories were modeled and at the same time a criterion of untried into modernity and on a measure of the distance yet to be covered. The already, even the side of Europe, the center, and the not yet, he saw the rest of the world, the periphery. The discovery and the shaping of the historical process ruled by progress corresponded to a happy time, both, both confident and victorious. It was also a time of philosophy of history, universal histories, and histories of civilization. As François Guizot pointed out in his 1828 course at the Sorbonne, I quote, the idea of progress and development seems to me to be the very basic idea contained under the word, the word civilization. And civilization, the word itself, as you notice, you have movement in it, with the civilization, the movement towards civilization. It has two dimensions, the development of human society and the development of man himself, in short, and I'm quoting Guizot, it is the idea of a people moving, not to change, to change places, but to change their frame of mind. Consequently, there will be a universal history of civilization to write. That was the conclusion of Gizu. It was necessary to wait until the 20th century to encounter civilization in the plural. Driven by acceleration, modern time carried with it notions of anachronism, survival, avant-garde, delay, and thanks to Charles Darwin, evolution. And when evolution was applied to human societies by Herbert Spencer, we had evolutionism. The railroad was quickly perceived as opening a new, I quote, a new era in the history of humanity. In 1837, the poet, and that's uh, uh, the poet Adalbert von Chamiso wanted, I quote, to take the train yoked to the zeitgeist. I could not have died, he said, in peace if I had not gazed upon the unfolding future, the unfolding future from the top of this triumphal chariot. End of quote. What one cannot describe the embarkation of historicism in modern regime in a more graphic and optimistic way. Only a few decades later, it was another railway enthusiast, Karl Marx, who expected revolutions to be the locomotives of history. Outside of Europe, outside of Europe, modern times brought the savage from the status of child which he had which he had held in missionary and settler discourses since the 16th century. So from the status of child to that of a primitive. He was not out of time completely, but so far back, so far back in the distant past, that he was placed outside of history and he had no history, no true history, according to the new meaning born by the modern concept of history, which sets itself up as a ruler of the world and, to use uh, Larousse's phrase, the new theology, the universal Clio. So it fell to the colonizers to bring this savage into history as well by making him by making him climb onto the train of history, if necessary, by force, but in any case, for his own good. 
the change <coughs> in that relationship during the intervening century between Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the founders of ethnology is striking. In his discourse on the origin of inequality in 1755, Rousseau encouraged the philosopher to travel. I quote, all the earth is covered with nations of which we know only the names, and yet, and yet, we lower, we lower ourselves by pronouncing judgment upon the human race. And it goes on, imagine a Montaigne, a Buffon, or a Tito traveling, observing, writing. Suppose then that they wrote the natural, moral, and political history of what they had seen. From their pen, we would then see ourselves emerging from a new world, and we would learn to know our own. Here, in Rousseau, the philosopher and the savage are still on the same level or in the same time. But only, only a few decades later, with, in 1799, the foundation of a society which called itself the Society of Human Observers, a Société des Observateurs de l'Homme, the philosophical journey became naturalized and temporalized. It now dates back to the origin of humanity. Savage peoples, I quote, tell us the story of our own ancestors and observations of them allow us to develop, quote, an exact scale of the various degrees of civilization. Here we have civilization, of course, in the singular, measure from the center, and the further we move from that center, the lower we descend on the ladder. But with evolutionism, temporalization became fully established, and the savage became primitive. He became seen less as our ancestor than as the last contemporary, contemporary of the woolly mammoth, for example. Certainly, the primitive was in time, and no longer out of time, like Rousseau's man of nature but it was in a time very distant from us. It was, the, the, the primitive, was a living anachronism, or this uh, geological formation which is called an in-layer, so uh, something which remained after the erosion. Meeting with tourist wild tribes is like Visiting monument of the past, says Lewis Morgan, who is one, as you know, one of the founders of the ethnology. For Edward Tiber, another founding father, the last testament of Tasmania are Paleolithic men. Quote, Paleolithic man has ceased to be a philosophical inference, inference and has become a tangible reality. In the first encounters with them at the beginning of the 19th century, they still seem to the discoverers to be representatives of a happy, carefree state of nature. The children of old became very old, which did not prevent them from being treated as children. The mention of Paleolithic man directly echoes the development of pre-history in the same in the same years. We went from the antediluvian man, and before the deluge of Boucher de Perth, for example, to prehistoric man. Excavation sites multiply. Based on those recent discoveries, the first ethnologists established a general framework they abstract an ethnological time and determine stages 
in the development of humanity in three parts, savage, barbarian, and civilized. In this book, Ancient, Ancient Society, published in 1877, Lewis Morgan, one of the founders, refined the division even further. The savage stage was divided into lower, middle, and higher, in accordance with what? In accordance with the archaeological model, which was put uh, up at the same moment. And the same went for the barbarian stage. As for the civilized stage, it's not such a big surprise, it was divided into ancient and modern, following the lines of the well-established pair of ancients and moderns. In this way, the modern regime of historicity displayed two sides. The side of progress and acceleration in Europe, and therefore at the center, and the side of evolution elsewhere at the periphery. At one pole, we find modern man, ever more preoccupied by the future, and at the other pole, primitive man, who vegetates in a stagnant time or a permanent present. Between the two, the two poles, every combination and intermediate temporal regime is possible. We are never had press for classifications. Colonization was able to exploit this to its advantage. Certainly, evolution or becoming was valid for the entire universe, but only Europe and above all Germany, England, and France was um, capable or were capable of, so to speak, extracting this incredible time, the modern one, from becoming. Only they were capable of transmuting, like the alchemist of old, the old time of the old regime of historicity into a new and modern time. This laborious operation, which extended over several centuries, was not inscribed in the destiny of Europe from all eternity. It could have turned out otherwise. All we can say is that a set of conditions made it possible I've stated some of them. On this somewhat prepared terrain, history, carried, carried by this futurist time, was ready to weave its grand narratives. And it was, it was these narratives which the European nation used, on the one hand, to confirm, confirm their election and justify their domination, and on the other, to sharpen their rivalries and fuel their antagonism. This path led directly to both sides' utter blindness during the Great War. From the word about the move from history to memory. And I'm going to use this. Do you see something? Yes. Okay. Two allegories, and you are the first one, you have one for the moment, give us a glimpse of this moment in history that can be described as European in the sense which we have just seen. The first showed the flight of history or the setting in motion of what I call the modern regime of historicity. The second one, I will. The second one, it's downfall. A history properly nailed to the ground and time fully stopped. I come back to the first. The first is what is it? The painting. Glorified Napoleon, executed by a painter named Alexandre Veron Belcourt, who is an academic painter who portrayed several scenes of imperial action. 
the painting is entitled Cleo's Shows the Nations the Memorable Deeds of His, his, Napoleon, of his Reign. It was presented at the Salon of 1806. You see a Cleo on the left dressed in the antique fashion pointing to what she has just written on a large scale, namely the achievements of Napoleon. And she did that, she's doing that, for a group of men in more or less exotic costumes. Indians with their feathers, Turks, Easterners, and far away, even Chinese, who are here, all of them, as studious, studious pupils in front of a blackboard. In the background, you have the Louvre. Napoleon is present in the form of a Roman uh, emperor bust. With the inscription, I don't know if you can read it, with the inscription, Wee, 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 of course. Clearly designating himself as a new Caesar. Scrolls appear at Cleo's foot, some of her previous works, where you can read, if you look closely, the names of Herodotus, Thucydides, and Xenophon. So, a classical work. The mise en scène follow the canons of Historia Magistra, we type. The exemplarity of a great man in the mold of Plutarch and Cleo as the distributor of glory. But I think that there is something more. Thin, which is, you can see, you can uh, grasp it, in the very movement of the painting. Napoleon is not only Caesar, he is also an incarnation of history. He is the force that moves, whose effects are felt to the very end of the earth, the one in whom is the one in whom Hegel saw the spirit of the world when he crossed Jena on horseback, supposedly so. In his uh, memoirs from beyond the grave, Chateaubriand wrote that for 16 years Napoleon had been failed, and a fate never at rest, constantly running to reshape Europe. He was, uh, wrote uh, Chateaubriand, that conqueror who spanned the hearse. In him, two traits of modern history become manifest. It's all on the fate of fate of men and nation and nations and his speed of execution. He never remained at rest. Napoleon emerged emerges while we are waiting for him elsewhere or waiting for him later. I think that in this painting you have some a result of one time now actor and process. A, a, a time was a synchronization of the world that occurred even as far as China. This is reflected in the composition of the painting. The modern regime of history, so to speak, gallops. To write itself, history passes from the establishment of synchronism, indispensable for establishing before and after, to something different, which is a synchronization which establishes, according to a time scale, the earlier than, the later than, and the advance and the delay, and which of which the exoticism of the costumes is a feature, or of already and not yet. The conqueror is also the great synchronizer. He is at the same time, if I use this uh, uh, famous uh, old expression is at the same time cosmocrator, the one who 
rather than the reign of the cosmos, and chronocrator, the master of the world and the master of time, is a rapid ride across Europe with his artillery trains and the civil cord in his luggage also expresses a clash of temporalities. With this allegory, we stand, I think, between Historia Magistra and the new history. The flight of the eagle is also history taking flight. At the other end of the arc, you have the second and the north. The second allegory, which conveys the fall of history. You know this, of course, is a sculpture created by Anselm Kiefer in 1989. And the title of this uh, sculpture is Angel, Angel of History, or Poppy and Memory. It directly references Walter, Walter Benjamin's Angel of History, of course. This one. Okay. Here in the Kiefer, the angel appears only in the form of a heavy bomber made of lead, and Kiefer had obtained a large quantity of lead from the roof of the Colonel Cathedral. A large aircraft with the crumpled cabin and wings, it seems more like an object excavated from an archaeological dig than a plane ready to take flight. This plane was uh, the messenger of history, but the history of death and destruction, which had taken place. On both the left and right wings, there is an arrangement of thick books, and we know that Kiefer liked that, very often books uh, in his uh, sculpture, plenty. Um, also made of lead, from which poppy flowers emerge. And the other title of the work, which refers to the Paul Celan collection, Poppy and Memory, a 972 publication about memory and forgetfulness in regard to the Holocaust. The poppy according to Selan, I quote, implies oblivion. Its flower, is, its flower is simultaneously a bearer of forgetfulness and an impediment to memory. And the forgetfulness it prompts is altogether impossible to forget. Let us return here only the allegory of a stopped history. The angel will not take flight again, nor will the plane. Time has stopped and a silence of death overs. The spectator is confronted with a past that doesn't pass, or with a dateless present, where only a relationship can take hold in which memory and forgetfulness mingle or even collide. Its silence, in all its multiple balances, has for years been its major expression. The plane, a proud vehicle of technological advances, like the railways in the 1830s, is in this case grounded, a witness of utter ruin. From now on, it belonged to the ruins it brought upon itself. 
can modern time, the time of the modern regime of historicity, resume its course on what would be the glory sound of Clio in reference to 1945, but conceive at the end of the 18, 1980s, Kiefer's work is a part of memory. It intends to pay tribute to the, the disaster and to ward off forgetting. In face with the rise of memory, it reinforces the visibility. Now I'm going to to this conjuncture where memory has become the point of view from which we view history. We are indeed in what psychoanalysis has called the afterworldness. These monuments, by their design and by their architecture, and we will the, the next one. This one is for the, the, the war, the First World War. That's it. And it was uh, inaugurated uh, two years ago. These monuments, by their design and by their architecture, are already testimonies in himself and of themselves. The first, in the memorial of the murdered Jews of Europe, finally inaugurated in 2025 in uh, Berlin. You know, of course, rather, you know this place. It is located on a lot near Hitler's bunker. It is the work of the American architect Peter Eisenman. The visitor discovered a film of 2,700 grey concrete study, arranged in an uneven way, which can give the impression of a ruined and abandoned cemetery. Without further indication or explanation, the visitor is invited to wander between the study and to be impressed, to be disturbed, by fact. In this maze, without words, memory comes via affect. If the visitor wants history, he or she must go down to the basement at the information center. There, a permanent exhibition allows one to see and read about the different traces of the extermination. This historical center which was not planned in the initial project, supports memory. The lieu d'histoire, place of history, is put in service of the lieu de mémoire, whose monument it seeks to be above all else. Turning back the flow of time, memory also took hold of the First World War, just and the few, the last few combatants were passing away. Many commemorations have marked the centennial celebration, and a big one, probably the biggest one, and the last, is coming very soon, on the 11th, November 11th. Even Trump will be in Paris, so you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Already on November 11, 2014, the President of the French Republic inaugurated a new memorial. 
this one. This one, which is called, that is its official title, name, is the ring of memory. The ring of memory or International Memorial of Notre Dame de Lorette. And Notre Dame de Lorette is a place. It's a place um, near in the north part, in the north of uh, France, uh, near the city of Arras. And this place was already the site of a national necropolis, inaugurated as the already in 1925, which gathered the remains of the soldiers who died in the violent fighting that had taken place on the hill of Notre Dame de Lorette in 1914-1915. So, it was already a place of memory. And you have even um, a lighthouse that was to signify this, uh, the, this light of memory. But this one is quite different. This memorial, designed by an architect, his name is Philippe Pro, has a large ellipse cantilevered on the edge of the plateau. I don't know if you see, yes, you can see that uh, um, ring. On the inside of the ring, there are plates bearing the 500,000, 80,000 uh, 500, names. Names of the soldiers who died this time between 1914 and 1918. The dead come from 40 nationalities. Their undifferentiated names following one after another in strict alphabetical order. That's what you see on the right. Entering the interior of the ring via a trench, the visitor enters, so to speak, into the memory of the place. And if he wishes history, history can tell him more about these names duly listed in the official registers, registers of the different countries at war. But nothing else, but nothing else, and nothing more. The ring loops around on itself. The unstable equilibrium of the construction, or at least its mise en scène, indicates perhaps the fragility of memory, because it's on the edge of this uh, plateau. Okay? If the place was no longer visited, if the names were no longer spelled, then forgetfulness would definitely gain, gain the upper hand. Thus, from Véron Belcourt pointing to the ring of memory, passing, passing through Kiefer's Angel of History and the Berlin Memorial, the march of history has turned into the path of memory. This is the overall movement and shift that has occurred, leading from the beginning of the modern regime of historicity to its question, from a glorious and imperious future to a dubious and threatening future, <coughs> from futurism to presentism, at least in Europe. But for a long time now, since at least this suicide of Europe, first diagnosed by Paul Valéry, the French poet 1919, Europe is no longer the center and is Clio, universal Clio, as lead, as lead in its wings. To maintain that historians would have only taken over Laos' mantra in total ignorance of what has taken place and continue to take place would be completely false. Doubts and questionings were expressed and reformulations have been proposed. 
Among them, let us mention the, the Alan founders, Mark Bloch and Lucien Fer, who wanted to insert the past-present relationship back at the heart, at the heart of the historical approach. As for anthropologists, Claude Lévi-Strauss challenged evolutionism in the race and history in 1952 and showed that civilizations were less staggered in time as spread out in space. As a result, progress has been demoted from a universal category to a, I quote, to a particular mode of existence peculiar, peculiar to our society. But my purpose is not to stop at this criticism, because we still must try to come to terms with Clio. This time, not from inside Europe, but from the outside. Until then, the particularly internal, internalist point of view has occurred at two registers, Clio and modern time, or the modern concept of history, and Clio looked at from memory or the fall of the modern regime of historicity. Of course, this modern Clio accompanied the colonizer, who sought to objectify and naturalize it, presenting it as the mistress of the world and the mistress of time. In return, the successes of conquest and domination helped to validate its relevance. But abandon the Christian schema of, his, of a history of salvation and providentialism, and modern time having started to run, evolutionism provides a new operative framework. Then Marxism brought the science of history, and after 1945, development and modernization became the watchwords of decolonization and major international organizations such as the United Nations and its various agencies. What had happened then is nothing less than a transfer from the modern regime of historicity. Everyone can have his own wagons in the train of history even if his own locality. Acceleration, the primacy of the future, the nation and nationalism, that is the theological story that goes with it, were all there. There were also variants, more or less revolutionary, which were based on the engine of the class struggle, where one of the great questions was who now took on the role of the proletariat. The Chinese Revolution was a huge blow. Marxism could help to drive out the colonizer, but it represented at the same time the most advanced point of the modern regime of historicity. In its case, it was necessary to make the past disappear with its injustices and its religious superstitions, and to be ready to sacrifice the present generations by fleshing out the counter-revolutionaries in order to make the future arrive, arrive as soon as possible. A note from the historian Dipesh Chakrabarti is quite illuminating. When speaking of his beginning as an historian in Calcutta with the famous subaltern studies group, the group we became famous, which in the 1970s brought together Indian historians who were Marxists. He writes that for them, I quote, Marx was a local Bengali name. In fact, they had never questioned his German origins, or the intellectual categories he mobilized, or the history of their development in European thought, in short. The question of the relationship between an idea and its place did not arise. Chakravarti took, I quote, for granted the universal relevance of European thought. It was only a few years later, once living in Australia, that he was able to engage, to engage 
in an effort of reflection that allow him to provincialize Europe. The title of his book, which quickly became a major reference in postcolonial studies, to provincialize Europe is to understand how Marx is not a local Bengali name. That is to say, it's to measure how the categories immobilized had a history and above all, to put itself in a position to perceive the gap between these categories and the non-Western realities that they were supposed to apprehend. This path of critical return with regard to European history is interesting because it faces the difficult question of knowing what to do with it today, but other more radical options have advocated and continue to advocate for its complete and definitive rejection, not to provincialize, but to forget Europe. The time difference between the Kiefer aircraft, which brings us back to 1945, and the date of the sculpture, 1989, gives the measure of the time it took in Europe to realize that the modern regime of historicity was shattered in 1945. Even if, perhaps especially if, the following decades were those of a frantic race for progress, armament, modernization, and also oblivion in the context of the antagonism between the East and the West, punctuated by the crisis of the Cold War. These years, one can th think retrospectively, have also made scream, preventing to see or to face what happened. But 19, in 1989, by the fall of the Berlin Wall and the announcement of the end of the Soviet Empire, we can recognize there <coughs> and then the final blow to modern times and the modern concept of history. Since the most futuristic ideology, with the ten of millions of deaths left behind, had failed. If the star had in fact been dead for quite some time already, its lights continue to reach different places on the earth and the historic school claiming it continue and some continue still. However, the failures of the revolutionary effervescence of the years 50s, 60s, which wanted to bear, for example, an organization like the Tri Continental, led the progressives here and there to turn away from a modernity which had once again deceived them. In the Middle East, the Iranian Revolution of 1939 opened a new path and allowed the substitution of the religious discourse for references and speeches of the left. And the, the impressive thing is that the quickness of the move from their leftist position to the uh, uh, discourse of the uh, Iranian Revolution. Another future sometimes with apocalyptic thoughts, was looming at the horizon. The modern concept of history was losing its ability to make sense, while what we call fundamentalism, but also some indigenous movements, gain in power and visibility. So, what has become the once Clio so uh, praised and, or even idolized? Does she still have a place in today's world? Or, in other words, is another concept of history on the verge of replacing the modern concept, which is no longer and can no longer be in phase with the world of this new century? As we have seen, memory is dominant in Europe and beyond. It has established and shaped a culture, a culture of memory which manifests itself in a large number of memorials and which gives a reason 
to a numerous commemoration, large and small. For one thing, history, the history of historians, has put itself in the service of this memory, which is in fact quite historical in its processes, as an, investiga as an investigation concerned with archives and all kinds of traces. These are voluntary memories, more to reconstruct, to reconstruct than to retrieve. Memory that we do not have, that we could not have, because the transmission could not be done of a lack of an absence that we seek to feel. Memories to be recognized in public space as a right, a right to memory. Moreover, to try to better stick to the reality of a world after the colonies and out of Yamta's divisions, the historians, to leave behind the national, imperial, and colonial histories, <coughs> histories have proposed answers, almost technical, or has been called connected history, shared history, cross history, and ultimately global history, which are not only, but also new paths to get rid of the modern regime of historicity and its theology. One thing is certain, if a new concept of history, perhaps one without the capital H, were to emerge, it will not be manufactured in the workshop of Europe. Until the time of history in the singular, or with capital H, 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 we have been only a moment, a moment in the life of Cleo, before there were histories, the plural, and after, perhaps, we are in the process of finding, finding, finding new kinds of histories, histories in the plural. Thank you.